Today here with Dr. Oz. I don't need to give the introduction. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you very much. Welcome to our studios. Dr. Oz, you are a very successful cardiac surgeon, an author, a talk show host, a two-time Emmy award-winning talk show host. <laughs> and in addition, you are a husband and a father to four children. How do you manage to do all these things so successfully? What drives you? You know, it's, it's not about the amount of time you have. It's about the, the amount of energy you have. So if the things that you're doing in your life give you more energy, you do more of them. So you mentioned all those things that I do. I, I, I love operating. When I'm in the operating room, I just feel in that zen moment, that very focused, grounded place. When I'm doing the television show, it's very similar sentiment because I'm in the middle of a studio and I've got people around me who know a lot more about what they do than I do, like how to run the lights and how to get the cameras to function. But I get to be in the middle, focused on the person that I'm talking to. And when I'm with my kids, it's the same experience. You have those real moments of intimacy you have connection where you look at them in the eyes and say I'm here for you and if you're doing things that bring you energy you never get tired mm -hmm. so I always tell my friends and my students look for the things that give you energy forget about how much time they take if they give you the right kind of energy you can do them all day long anyway okay everyone asks you about diet and health I want to focus on Dr. Oz as the doctor and the person you're very passionate in your teaching and you're also very passionate during your show doctors strive to have such great bedside bedside manners how do you did you acquire such empathy you know I think doctors healers learn how to heal and they learn the compassion that goes along with it from their parents you don't learn it in medical school you have mentors that can perhaps model this for you. But, uh, you know, it's my mom I should pay tribute to because my mom is the one who, who took care of people in her life with love. I, I saw the energy that was positive that she brought to those relationships. And, you know, what you have to learn to do as a doctor is to give people bad news and have them still respect you. Have them still feel honored by you. Have them still trust you. And on the show, it's the exact same experience. If I can come into your home, and you remember, I'm your guest. You're inviting me into your house. So I'm coming into your home as a talk show host and bringing my friends with me to, to honor you, I've got to go there with the right energy. If I'm there beating you and pointing my mm -hmm. finger at you, you don't want to do that. You're, you're there to have fun. You're there to be playful, to feel uplifted. But I'm going in there and telling you things that maybe you don't want to hear about how heavy you are, but I'm doing it in a loving, supportive way where, where I'm giving you uh, a lift up. Then you say, you know what? I know this is not going to be comfortable, but it's still the right thing to do. It's why we connect with people who tell us the truth. It's much more valuable to have friends that are honorable with you than enable you. That's true. Communicating with the patients, whether they're sick or their health, will always be important. Yet, with the field of medicine in a constant state of change, what emerging technologies do you see is going to be impacting more within the next three to five years? And most importantly, how are the countries, the governments, people going to afford it? We have a lot of advances that we're making that reduce the um, the bigness of surgery. We can make them minimally invasive. We can make them uh, much easier to recover from. So we have moved from being focused on how many lives we save to the quality of the lives of the people who we save. So for example, I've been involved in crafting some of the catheters mm -hmm. that change valves inside the heart. We have a new catheter that, that uh, I just wrote about uh, recently in, a, in, a, in, a, in Time Magazine that, that allows us to treat hypertension without using medications. So there's lots of things we can do that are expensive but are impactful. Mm -hmm. The question that you ask is a very important one. How do we pay for it? I think the most expensive thing in medicine is bad medicine. Mm -hmm. It's not high technology medicine. It's medicine not done right. We overuse medications. We don't use procedures the right way. We take care of people who don't need our help uh, because they're, they would have done fine without it. And we don't treat people who would have desperately needed our help. So I think it's about us using information to drive better quality in the system. I look around here in the Bloomberg mm -hmm. building, and I see numbers everywhere. When we're in a hospital, we don't have numbers like that mm -hmm. unless we're in a very focused setting, like in the operating room doing heart surgery, where I have numbers that look just like these screens behind me. But in medicine, we have to get that information, grab that digital exhaust, the leftover information when we collect all the content about who you are, where you are, how I'm treating you, and begin to use that to drive decision making. That'll make it much easier for doctors to do the right thing. And mm. fundamentally, that's what prevention is about, making it easy to do the right thing. Mm. Talking about doctors, historically, physicians have earned great salaries, good salaries, but with all the technological, regulatory, and economic factors affecting the field of medicine today, what are your thoughts about the future, especially the career and salary potential for young people entering the career, what advice do you have for them? There's no question that the salaries of doctors will decrease and continue to decrease. They have been throughout my career as well. But I always tell the medical students, uh, and I tell this to my kids as well, and I think it's applicable to anybody, you should go into what you love, not what you get paid to do. Because if you go into something for the money and, and it's not fun and the money falls away, you're really unhappy. 
But if you go to something that you love, you'll be the best at it. And if you're the best at it, people will pay you. The best doctors will always be really well paid. They always have been. They will always continue to be. But if you're doing medicine because it's a job and you'd rather be somewhere else, you'll be average at it most likely. And you won't get paid as much either. So for a lot of reasons, both your personal health but also your financial well-being, it makes sense to do what you love doing because that way you put the time required, which we think is probably 10,000 hours mm -hmm. on any activity. I could learn to play the guitar really, really well in 10,000 hours, but I'll never take 10,000 hours to do it unless I adore it. Mm. And last question. How about you, Dr. Oz? If you were not a doctor, what would you be? You know, I always wanted to be a professional athlete. I had gone to college hoping that I'd play professional football. Uh, I wasn't good enough, but I <laughs> learned a lot about my body along the way, and I became infatuated with medicine and how it could teach us about how to control what's happening inside of us. Because if we can control what's happening inside of our body, then we can begin to change the world around it. Perfect. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me.